I don't know if they're gonna, there you go. All right, thank you, thank you. Welcome to Meltdown Comics. Very special event for you guys tonight. Obviously you know about it, because you're here. So we are going to have a Q&A session. Daniel Klaus and Mark from Boing Boing. It's gonna probably go about 45 minutes. After that, there'll be a signing. If you bought the eight ball uh, book, you'll get priority signing. There'll be three things that can be signed. So if you have it, great. And then everyone else after the eight ball VIPs. So enjoy, relax. There's some refreshments in the back. And if you need anything, let me know. Again, my name's Adam. Thank you for coming. Mark and Daniel, can you come on out? Hello. Hey, everybody. So, wow, we were here like in 2012, I think. Right? Was last I, time? You have to tell me. I don't I remember anything. <laughs> I'm not sure, was that before or after you uh, had heart surgery? That was after. after. That was 2006, okay. yeah. Okay. So I was already bionic. All right. Uh, how many of you were here last time we, we had this discussion? Just a couple. Wow, a lot of new people. Well, All right, let's I'm just rehash that old one. <laughs> yeah, I, I shouldn't have wasted time. We could just like lip sync it from the, from the YouTube video. <coughs> So, so this is the, uh, the 25th anniversary of the uh, beginning of 8-Ball. Yes. And so um, my, my first question is, w what do you think when you look at the, the very first issues of 8-Ball? You had to reread the whole thing when you did. So what kind of went through your mind when you looked at these first issues? Yeah, it's, well, it's, you know, I never, I never reread any of my old stuff you know i just i have a closet filled with my old comics and once they enter that closet they're dead to me mm -hmm. you know i just i don't want to think about them <coughs> and uh and so to do this book i was actually asked to do this book i think 10 or more years ago i think it was for like the 12th anniversary <laughs> or something and uh and i was like i just can't bear to look at those old comics and so uh so for this book, I said, like, I'm going to steal myself. I'm going to sit down and I'm going to read these old comics. And it was, it was like seeing them for the first time. Like I really didn't remember any of it. You know, there were like little panels that, oh yeah, I remember doing that. But I was like reading my own jokes, and I was like, ha ha ha, this is <laughs> hilarious. I was, I felt like such, like my wife would walk in and it's like, what are you laughing at? It's like my own comics. These are great. It was very. I was sort of pleasantly surprised. I was like, these are pretty good. I really thought of them like, these are so bad, <laughs> like so embarrassing. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they were all right. Um, what, uh, d d d <laughs> do you, um, how do you think the themes of what you explored changed throughout the, the, the 25 years? Well, sir, I mean, one of the main consistencies is that I never once thought about like, what themes am I exploring with these <laughs> comics? <laughs> that was certainly no nothing that ever entered my mind, mm -hmm. you know. I. Uh, you know, you look at them and you certainly see many, many uh, similar things appearing. You know, you see, uh, you know, I, I realized how many thousands of times I've drawn like a lone character facing an urban background, you know. So it's like, a, like the back of somebody's head facing like a city. And every, every time I drew it, I thought, this will be a great panel. I've got a great idea. This is the first time I've ever done that. <laughs> and then you look back and you're like, it was like pathological, like just <laughs> like, just driven. You know, it's like a guy who fills a notebook with, with like, you know, hash marks, just like to <laughs> fill the pages. Like it really uh -huh. it has that kind of insanity. But to maybe it. that has some, something, uh, a meaning to you. Have you ever thought why you keep on revisiting that same scene? I think, oh yeah, I have thought, I've thought a lot about it. <laughs> um, I mean, I think that's just certainly the way I see the world. You know, I think I was always very like sort of lonely, isolated kid living in 1970s Chicago, which was certainly an urban wasteland if mm -hmm. there ever was one. Mm -hmm. And I think that was just the way I felt, you know, leaving the house, that was my way of you know, how I felt in the world, this sort of lone, heroic, uh, you know, Steve Ditko character walking around the water towers of Chicago. Uh -huh. You know, and it's, 
you look at cartoonists' work and you can really imagine how they grew up. You know, like you look at the Hernandez brothers' work and there's always like 50 people in every panel. And you realize they grew up really with a lot of people. You know, they had a lot of brothers and sisters. And it really has that feel of that's, you know, that's how they grew up. There's never a panel in their work of the lone guy in the urban <laughs> background, you know. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very different thing. But it, it's fun to go through people's work and kind of analyze how they, how they uh, you know, react to their surroundings and how they felt growing up. Yeah. Steve Ditko certainly <coughs> is very similar to my comics. You know, it's always a lone weirdo, mm -hmm. you know, screaming at the world. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you could go back in time and give advice to a young Dan Klaus in his, his early 20s uh, about 8-Ball, what, what would you say to him? You mean, well, knowing what I know now, I guess that's a very different thing than if there was an actual young, if I were actually to do that, I would say, don't do this. <laughs> This is a horrible idea, but since it all worked out, I mean, I think, I always think the thing I would have told, I would have, I wish I had done actually, is to never make any public appearances or ever do any interviews. Because <laughs> then you're like, then you're the coolest guy in the world. Then everybody would be so intrigued, like, who is this guy? You know, J.D. Salinger, if he had kept writing, nobody would have cared. They'd, oh, that guy who wrote that book. But and yet people were were obsessed with him till the day he died. But the minute you do one interview, you're you're sunk because then you have an interview, mm -hmm. and then everybody reads that first interview. And my first interviews, of course, were were you know borderline retarded, <laughs> and and uh, you know and so that's all you have to say on any subject. And they go, well, here's what he thinks about that. And you, then your your opinion when you're 23 years old becomes your official stance on everything, you know, <laughs> nobody wants that. So you have to, you have to kind of keep revisiting the interview over and over and honing it till it comes closer to something that sounds remotely like what you actually believe. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if you never did that in the first place, you could just be so mysterious, so, so yeah. compelling. And plus you wouldn't have to do interviews. It works for <laughs> Thomas. It works for Thomas Pinchon. I know, sure. but he even he has that <coughs> high school photo that's out there, and everybody. That's what he looks like. What a weirdo! <laughs> so, so uh, has there any? Has there been like a one hardest thing <coughs> that to do with eight ball? Like, wh what's what's the hardest thing when you when you would sit down and, and work on eight ball? You mean back back yeah, then? Yeah, back then or throughout um, the whole process. Like Boy, the hardest thing. Nothing. Nothing was. Well, when I was when I was working on that velvet glove story, I really started out in sort of just a fever pitch of of just like crazy ideas coming to me, and I was taking that in all these different directions that I had no idea like where I was going after that. You know, it was really a, a stream of consciousness kind of thing, and I and I just you know I was just going with it. I was just like. I want this to be as exciting to the reader as it is to me, so I'm just gonna like go into it like it's a total mystery to me as well as to whoever's reading this. And you know, about three quarters of the way through that, I was like, oh no, what am I gonna do? <laughs> How am I gonna get out of this? And that was that involved some truly, uh, you know, some real struggles trying to imagine how I could sort of keep the integrity of that craziness mm -hmm. and yet still end the story because <laughs> that was my main goal at a certain point it was like i just want to end this i just want to you know move on to something else was but i but i couldn't just you know sorry folks that's it uh, yeah of course not um was there someone that you could talk to and like bounce ideas off do you do that with your wife no never no i i have her uh it's such a tense situation like i used to have her read the books before anybody else you know read it like as I was working on it, but the tiniest little hint of any feeling, any anything at all, I'm like, oh no, I failed. You know, I, I have to change. And I've actually like changed things completely just because she like yawned at the wrong moment. <laughs> you know, it's like that's not working. I got to uh -huh. change it. You know, and and uh, and so I recently, you know, a couple of years ago, I decided like I don't want to put her through that. It's just it's a horrible thing to do mm -hmm. to somebody like. <laughs> Here I'm forcing you to be my only audience, but you have to love everything. So, uh, 
Yeah, so I, nobody reads it mm -hmm. until it's totally done. Wow, and inked and yeah. everything. So, so you, you don't everything. really have an editor? No, no. no. Just... Everybody's like knows I would have a tantrum if they said anything bad. So, <laughs> like, it's great. So I literally, like I could do the worst comic and everybody, all the people around me, all the yes men <laughs> around me would be like, it's great. <laughs> and it would come out and then everybody would hate it. And I'd be like, why didn't anybody tell me? <laughs> um, so uh, I, I had fun going through all the, the stories too, like looking at this collection. Um, and uh, I, I was also reading some of your early interviews too. Uh, w one thing that I thought was interesting, um, you um, said that uh, you um, you used to feel somewhat limited in, in what you were capable of drawing, and then you had an experience with your son that it was kind of, kind of a breakthrough. Do you remember what yeah. I'm talking about? Yeah, my son um, he has a very dictatorial personality and really did when he was four or five years old. And he was, a, he was, like many boys, he was obsessed with Thomas the Tank Engine. But he took it way farther where he really got into trains and he knew all of the parts of trains. And we used to have to take him to like model railroading events where he would meet with old pedophiles who were into trains. <laughs> and and, and uh, I mean, it, it, was, it was a very train-centric, and there could be nothing I'd be less into drawing than a train. Uh -huh. And yet, every single day, I had to draw at least 10 trains, and it would be like, it's coming out of a tunnel in perspective, coming at you with horses flying off the thing. And, and it and was... These are his instructions? Yeah, he would just... Uh -huh. uh, he, ne he can't draw at all. He has no interest in drawing, because he's like, you do it. You can do it. <laughs> Why do I need to do it? And uh, and so yeah, and so every day I would have to draw these demented scenarios with flying trains and and animals, which is the other thing I n never drew in my life. And so after a while, I was like, yeah, sure, I can draw a train coming at you in in forced three point perspective that's you know flying off Jupiter with a <laughs> rocket blaster on the back. You know, <laughs> why not? You know, and and uh, and I. I remember one day thinking, like, I can do anything now that I can <laughs> draw these trains. So it was a really, it was, a, you know, as much as I cursed every day having to draw those trains. I still have a, I should do a book of those trains. I saved them all. Yeah, that would be yeah. cool. Yeah, it would be those. very cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another thing uh, about, about being a father, um, yeah. I remember reading an interview where you said that you really didn't become an adult. You didn't become an adult until you had a child. And, and I'm wondering, how did that change uh, your work? I don't know. If, I'm not sure it changed my work. I'm not sure I became an adult in my work somehow. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a, you have to sort of uh, create a different space in your work. But um, I don't know. I just, uh, we, all have, we all have friends who never had kids who turn 45. And you realize when you have kids and you're 45, you realize like they're just like they're basically teenagers still. You know, they can, mm -hmm. and and I envy that so much that they can just like live like that. They could just stay up late and watch a movie like that. I can never do that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a, if I stayed up past two in the morning to watch a movie, I'd be up the next morning at seven, and I'd be like, why did I do that? Yeah. You know, and so it's, uh, you know, it's. Y Everything, every, uh, things really change in, in your way you view the world. You know, you're really viewing it from, from that adult perspective rather than looking up as a kid. You know, you don't th think about your relationship to adults anymore. You are the adult. You know, I used to always think about, like, everybody was like the, the man to me. You know, I always imagine everybody, everybody is oppressing me. And then I realized, like, oh, I'm just like, that's because I'm still a kid. And now I, now I think, like, I'm the oppressor. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I'm the one. I'm the exactly. one who gets to bum bum out a human being every day. Yeah. Gets to thwart his little dreams. Yeah. I, I notice also like when you become a parent, when you watch movies you watched when you were younger, then you like you associate with the with the parents of the movie instead of the, the kids. Oh yeah. I actually had that with Ghost World, you know, when I wrote the book. Mm -hmm. Originally I was like, you know, I sort of, I was 
related to the two girls or to the Josh character who knows the girls, you know. But I felt like in their circle, pretty much. And then when I reread it years later, I was like, the dad is the only voice of reason. <laughs> <laughs> Poor dad doesn't get any credit. <laughs> it's relating to Bob Balaban. That's, I don't know what that says. So, so Dan, I, I have to ask you, um, you have never tweeted in your life, and I don't think you have a Facebook page either. I, well, I have all those things, but I don't have the password. Uh -huh. <laughs> 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 I have a young person who does that for me. Well, actually, he's not so young anymore. What is the, uh, wh why not? Why, why do you avoid that kind of stuff? I don't know. It's, it seems undignified. <laughs> 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 I just don't have anything to like that. I like the thought. There's something really sad to me about people who are tweeting who have to like come up with jokes and have to tweet four jokes a day. That just seems sad. <laughs> I don't know. I wouldn't want to have to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I would put too much pressure on myself. Mm -hmm. Once for a while, there was a guy who had a fake Twitter pretending to be me, <laughs> and he was really trying to like trying his best to be what he thought I would be like if I was tweeting and it was so depressing to read what his vision of me was like I that was like the closest to suicide over Twitter that I've ever had it was just like he just would he just had no sense of how I would actually be it was just really gloomy and grim and but with no humor at all and I was like but why would he do that why would anybody do that it's did very strange did he just like give up or did you tell him to stop I made uh, I made fanographics pretend to have lawyers that they could sick on. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of lawyers, maybe this is a good time uh, to give an update with what uh, ever became of the uh, Shia LaBeouf uh, story. <laughs> I, I think he, are you familiar with what? <laughs> no one. So so uh, the actor Shia LaBeouf, like we're in L.A. Plagi they must know this. Plagiarized uh, Dan's story. Which which story was it? It was a story I did for a, uh, a, it was actually the only story I've ever done for charity. It was for a, a uh, collection of stories where you were supposed to just make up a character and do a story about this character you've never done anything with. Mm -hmm. And it was a book where the proceeds all went to um, teach literacy in inner oh, city it schools. One of the it was a McSweeney's and yeah. Zadie Smith had put it together. And it, I had done this story right before I was about to have that heart surgery, and I really felt like, well, this is the last thing I'll ever do. I was almost 100% sure, like, this is it. This is my swan song. And so I did this four-page story about a film critic where I was trying to really understand the part of myself that's, that's sort of a born critic, that's a part of myself I don't really like. <laughs> and so that's what the story was about. And I was in this book, nobody ever noticed it, and uh, then, I don't know, whenever it was last year, a year and a half ago, I get an email in the morning, somebody says, oh, you never told me about this, uh, this that Shia LaBeouf film, that came out really great, what's that, you know, you must be really happy with that, and I was like, what? And I was trying to think, like, did I sign some paper that I don't remember? And he, I said, uh, can you send me the link for that? And I went, and I look at this film, and I'm like, I, at first, I couldn't even see it as my work. I was like, what is this? It seems really weird and familiar. And then I, and I was, all of a sudden, I was like, wow, this is really well written. <laughs> and then I realized, like, wait a minute, I wrote that. And I went and dug out the comic, and I, and I looked at it, and it was literally just verbatim, just everything the character word said. Word for word. Word for yeah. word. Like, not, like a few little things changed. Like he changed, uh, ba I had bagels in mine, and he changed it to cookies, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> And he changed all the character names, and that was it. And I was just—it—it it was such a weird experience. You know, it's like one of those experiences where you wake up and just the world is all different. You know, like you open your bedroom door and it's like, when did I paint the house purple? What ha you know? And uh, and then all, all of a sudden, within like two hours, I started getting calls from like TMZ and. You know, Sienna, every, everybody's like, you got to come into the network tomorrow and do an interview about this. And I was like, I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to be part of it. You know, it's <laughs> like I don't want to be in a media circus. But it was really super overwhelming for, for weeks and weeks. And then, of course, he just made it worse by not just going like, oops, sorry, and bye. 
you know, he really like milked it for. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, describe what he did. I mean, he 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 started posting plagiarized apologies. Yeah, he started Twitter. posting all this crazy stuff. Then the weirdest thing was, I was like, I was out with my family one day. We were like out in a on a uh, boat in the bay, and we came back, and I had like three million messages on my phone, and he had uh, skywritten in L.A. I am sorry, Daniel Klaus in the skies of L.A. where I don't live. <laughs> <laughs> and people like, I was getting tweets from people who were like, I was at the Griffith Observatory and saw this in the sky. And I'm like, what is going on? And you know, at that moment you start to fear for your safety. You know, you start to think like, this is one inch away from like, hi, I'm at your door. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so it was quite disconcerting yeah. to say the least. Yeah. So, so how has this resolved itself? I mean, this was like a year or ago at least. I mean, what, what's happened since then? I mean, Did it just wither? I mean, I mean, the horrible thing is he's obviously got these total motherfucker lawyers. You know, like mm -hmm. he's got just lawyers that could bury anybody. Mm -hmm. And I'm like the only guy in alternative comics who actually had, I already have like legal representation and like I know that world pretty well and so I was able to get my own motherfucker <laughs> who, would, <laughs> who took him t took him into mediation and we settled for an amount and it was a total nightmare to deal with but mm -hmm. but I actually am a person who could do that and, I, and I'm also the one person who you know their lawyer was was trying to say like you're you know there's no this is a four page comic that has no real value and I was like, I, I'm the only person in the world who's ever had a four-page comic turned into a major motion picture. Yeah, <laughs> you know, Art like it's, that actually did happen. Yeah. So I actually had like a precedent <coughs> for it and everything. That's excellent. Yeah. And uh, but the thought that that you could do that to any number of young cartoonists, you could just steal anything they do and just have some big lawyer who could just crush yeah. you, and there's nothing you could do about it. No lawyer, no lawyer's going to take your case. Just on contingency, mm -hmm. you know, it's mm -hmm. it's really scary. Yeah, that's that's awful. Yeah, it's it is awful. So that's why I feel like unforgiving, you know. Yeah. Like I just feel like that's not a cool thing at all to do. Like to do that and to then hire your your asshole lawyers. Is yeah. And did he ever like reach out personally for an apology, like to try to call you on the phone or send you an email or anything? No. No. Wow. Wow. Um. Tell us about uh, your upcoming movie. Uh, you've got a new movie called Wilson that's, uh, that's yeah. that you wrote. Yeah, I yeah. wrote it. Let's hear um, about it. Well, if you've read the book, it's it's an adaptation of that lovely feel-good book of 2010. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, all I know is it's it's about to be filmed, and Woody Harrelson is playing Wilson, which is exciting. Cool. And Laura Dern is going to play his... Uh, his uh, ex-wife, and she's uh, Judy Greer is going to play his newish girlfriend. And the thing I'm most excited about is the uh, cinematographer is Frederick Elms, who did Eraserhead and Blue Velvet and many other great movies, oh The wow. Ice Storm. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, yeah. So I'm excited about that. But I'm, I'm. It's in filming in Minneapolis, and I have a book to finish, so I'm not going to really like be part of it or anything. So, so hoping for the best. Do you not have a production role in this one, then? No, no. I don't really. There's no. As many people here probably know, it's no fun to make a movie. <laughs> there's really. It's like you have to get up early. <laughs> I don't like to get. Up, I don't know how anybody can do good work on that schedule. You have to get up at like five in the morning and then work. 14 hours, mm -hmm. and it's like, I can't even do good work, like on a good night's sleep for more than two hours or three hours a day. <laughs> <laughs> really, you know, and most yeah. most writers or artists you talk to, and they have like four or five good hours a day, mm -hmm. and it's, it's just not a good way to work, and I just felt like I'll never do good work in that, in that world, you know, if I were, I, luckily I had no real great role in any of the movies I've worked on, you know, in terms of the production, but if I were to ever try to direct a movie or something I I'd have to find a way to do it like on the weekends for two hours <laughs> every time <laughs> uh -huh. like boyhood or something like characters age unintentionally in this film <laughs> <laughs> they're supposed to be in the course of one afternoon but the guy is 15 <laughs> years older um, uh, 
I, I know quite a bit about your comics, having read them. I don't know I'll too, too much about your, your personal life, really. Um, I'm just curious, That's what's your you idea? don't want to know. <laughs> what, what's your idea of a perfect weekend? Perfect weekend? Jeez, I haven't had a perfect weekend <laughs> in a long time. <laughs> Pro, you know. Well, think, of, think of what it would be. I, I can't. That's a question I literally can't answer. Because really, to me, the most fun I have is drawing comics. Mm -hmm. And that's my perfect weekday. Mm -hmm. And, you know, hanging out with my family and, and then working on the comics is there's really nothing better than that. So I can't, you know, I can't make up something. It's mm -hmm. like to, you know, walk naked in a waterfall or something. And it's <laughs> That's great, though. So you're doing exactly what you want to do. Very nice. Yeah, or just I, ha I have very low ambitions. <laughs> <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> so um, what I think that I probably ask enough questions. I, I think it would be fun to have some questions from you guys so uh, all right um, we can just uh, I'll look and, and raise your hand and I'll I'll point to you we can't see and anything can shout. So okay to right, move around right over there in the glasses I'm just curious about what kind of training you have did you train to be a cartoonist did you go to art school or I did I went to art school I went to Pratt Institute in uh, Brooklyn New York which where I learned absolutely nothing about how to be a cartoonist <laughs> <laughs> but I will say I did meet, um, I met a lot of friends who were in the same boat I was who wanted to be cartoonists. And we just sort of wound up in art school because that was the closest thing to, to what we wanted to do, you know. And we all uh, kind of bonded together and, and kind of figured out that we could do our own comics and kind of not, uh, not worry about our grades in art school because there's literally nothing less significant than that. <laughs> Right there. Yeah, I'm interested is, has anything really dramatically changed um, in your routine of creating comics over the years you've made 8-Ball? Um, you know, I never, I, I've always, I'm always looking for the routine. Like, I would love to have that, where it's like, I've got my little, you know, I sharpen my pencils, and I have my little ritual, and I say my, you know, rosaries or whatever, and then I sit down and dry, you know, and it's worked. But I, but I've never found that routine, and I think that's, it's probably much for the best. I think that's why my work's always veering in, in different directions, because I'm always like, this one I'm going to try in with this method, and, and I'll try something completely new for each book. That so that's just it's, well, it's, I'm always looking for the, the one that's going to stick, you know, and that I'll keep using forever. But now at my age, I'm sort of like, I'm aware that that's unlikely. But, you know, I've tried them. I've tried like, typing out a script and you know having it all perfect beforehand and I've tried making it up panel by panel as I went along and I've tried anything in between those two things and none of them are quite comfortable you know but they all kind of wind up the same that's the weird thing you know have you uh, are, are you uh, happy that there's things like Google image search as a way to like give you photo uh, drawing references do you make use yeah, of that? Yeah, although it, it always feels like cheating somehow. Like it used to be old uh, old time illustrators had had to have what they called a photo morgue, mm -hmm. which I love that phrase. It's like you've killed them. Yeah. And you and it, and like if you look in old uh, you know, home illustration courses and things like that, like you've got to keep up your morgue, you got to mm -hmm. keep it up to date. And it was people would have these insane files of like, you know, Cars, guns, airplanes, you know, just everything you'd have to draw and they'd have to be constantly clipping magazines and it just seemed like such a nightmarish chore that people had to go through that I sort of feel like, oh, I should be doing that, you know, there's <laughs> something about that. that mm -hmm. Like in New York, they used to have a, a picture library as part of the New York Public Library and you could go in there and you would see all these other artists, you know, looking for pictures of, of uh, you know, actors and and anything you know whatever whatever you needed and somehow i never use google image search because it's so easy that's interesting yeah you want to do it the hard every way. once in a while if there's something like i just i cannot figure out how to draw mm -hmm. like when i was drawing the trains i would <laughs> use <Yeah. laughs> but yeah. but uh but for the most part it's just there's something i don't know i always feel like i'm just drawing the first one that appears on google images uh -huh. you know i would have to <laughs> yeah. look on page like 85 <laughs> like there it is <laughs> Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, uh, another question. Back there. Hi. You know, that's the, that was a cartoon, right? 
it's not real. <laughs> They're not real. Um, yeah, that was that was very exciting. It was. Uh, it, I had to you know record my voice for The Simpsons, and I walked in and I would, and I thought like I'm gonna really like practice my lines and I'm gonna really do it and and I did you know read through it and did my lines and I thought I was really like acting and emoting and he was like can you take it up like 5,000 notches <laughs> and, and, and by the end I felt like I was just shouting I felt like I was just like yeah you know like I was like a like a you know AM morning drive time DJ in, in you know Nashville or so just like totally hey everybody you know and uh, and then and then I was like, I did like a thousand takes. And, and then at, at the end, I was like, was that, you know, did that work out okay? And he was like, yeah, yeah, we can splice it together. <laughs> and I could, I, when I watched the show, I could tell it was like, hi, my name is Daniel. Cla you know, was, I was so, my wife was like, who did your voice? It wasn't you. I had a weird, weirdly, I have like a weird New York accent in it for some reason. It's like it came out somehow. I don't know why. I asked when I was on that. I asked him like, "Am I the least famous guest on ever on the show?" And he was like, "No, there was one guy who was like the runner-up in the Nobel Prize, and we made fun of him because he was the he was so unfamous, and he was slightly less famous than you are." <laughs> <laughs> so I was the second least. Okay. Hi. Uh, it's it's a it's my new book that I'm working on right now. I'm almost done. That will be out next year. And, and what's uh, it called? It's called Patience. Mm -hmm. Like patience in a hospital or patience. Patience, like, like wait, wait for it. Yeah. And I, you know, I don't. Anything I would say about it would would make people think I was losing my mind. So I think I better not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, you'll enjoy it. Okay. How about in the, the poncho? Yeah. How did you reach out to you from Ghost World film, and how was the relationship to you with that role? Um, I was approached by Terry Zwigoff, the director, who just he liked the he liked the book, and uh, I don't know, he's trying to find a cheap screenwriter, I think. Um, but yeah, working on those scripts, it's uh, you know when you have an actual deadline and you have people who read it really critically, unlike as I was talking about with my comics, where I don't have any real criticism beforehand. You know, with the f film scripts, every line, they're like, got to take this out. This is no good. This, n nobody has a good word to say about it. And so I found that really, uh, that was very helpful to kind of see that kind of micromanaging. It was very helpful for, for my own writing. That is really interesting, yeah, to think about doing your comics and you're like in this bubble and then yeah. doing a script and it's like dozens and dozens of people are well, seeing it. it and it's a very small amount of people. You know, it's, it's only a lot of those, I've written scripts that have only been read by 20 people, you know, that I put a lot of work into. And each of those people had so much, you know, criticism <laughs> and so, mm -hmm. you know, it was all, it's always usually very helpful and pointed and stuff, mm -hmm. but it's really interesting. But it's all the kind of stuff that if somebody said that about one of my comics, I would be like, no, no, it's, I like it the way it is, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. It's a, it's a very different process. Yeah, you're controlling yeah. every aspect of it. Yeah, I just don't really, I don't want to like change anything for an audience in the comics. Mm -hmm. I want them to be as pure as possible, just me unfiltered, you know. Yeah, well, I'm glad that you do it that way. I think we have time for like one more question, actually. Um, in addition to your talent to draw, do you have a talent to write? How did you acquire that talent to write? You know, when I first started out, I just I just wanted to draw. I never thought of myself as a writer at all, and I never had any real interest in writing when I was younger. And when I uh, when I first got out of art school, I really had this plan: like I'm going to find a writer, and we'll team up and we'll be like, he'll write and I'll draw and it's, that'll be, you know, it'll be awesome. And uh, and I looked and looked and I kept asking, I'd meet these guys who are like really funny, like, oh, this guy's hilarious, this guy'd be a great writer. And I'd say, can you write any stories? And they would write stories for me and I'm like, this is horrible, I could write a better story than that. And so I finally, I started writing my own stories just out of 
desperation just by default. And I kept still hoping, like, I'm going to find the guy who can write these kind of stories. And then at a certain point I realized, oh, it's just because I have these real specific ideas of what I want to do. And of course, I'm the only guy who can write them. And at that point, I thought, I better learn how to write, <laughs> because I'm not going to ever find anybody else to, to do that for me. So how did you learn to read? Reading a lot, you know, reading this, and, and, and like analyzing the stuff that I really liked, what, what makes it work. But a lot of it's just intuition for based on reading and watching movies and, you know, studying comics a lot. A lot of, a lot of it's studying what you hate in other things is very helpful. You know, like, I really hate this kind of thing, so I don't want to ever approach that. So I've got to not do that. You know, that's, that's very helpful. Can't, you know, that was a long time ago. I, I was uh, somehow, it was a drug deal gone bad with Gaston and <laughs> I found myself in a dark alley with guns faced at my head. Um, yeah, I can't remember. I think it was like Gaston said, like, do you want to make $800 drawing a logo? And I was like, yes! <laughs> 800? Uh, I think that was about it. All I, do, all I remember is I drew, the, the original one I drew looked exactly, totally inadvertently looked exactly like the aliens on The Simpsons, which I had, I had not seen them yet. I think they'd only been on the show once or twice at that point. So you had to redo And them. so he was like, oh, you can't do that. It looked just like the Simpsons aliens. And I was like, oh, crap, I got to redo the Meltdown look. <laughs> so yeah, I, don't, I have no like, you know, fond memories of that summer because I literally couldn't tell you when that was. <laughs> it was a, too long ago. I'm, I'm old. So, okay, one, one more. Does someone have like a great question to ask? How's that? Okay. No pressure right at all. There, yeah. I was just curious. Hi. Hi. We can't, you're a silhouette to us. Um, you know, I was inspired a lot by, by young women I went to art school with. You know, I sort of felt like I knew those two. I, I knew a lot of pairs like that, where there'd be the one who's kind of loudmouth and the one quiet one who was actually kind of meaner than the loudmouth one. <laughs> <laughs> and I always found that a really interesting dynamic. And then I sort of realized that I was part of that when I was in high school. I was kind of the quiet, mean one, and I had a friend who was a loudmouth who would, I would whisper mean jokes and he would yell them out <laughs> and he'd get all the laughs. And I'd be like, but I was the one who... <laughs> But everybody thought I was really nice, so it worked to my advantage. And my, and my wife grew up in Pasadena. She was, you know, like drove a hearse in high school and all that. And so she, you know, she had Enid-like tales of of growing up here. And so I, I got a lot of the just sort of nuts and bolts stuff from her of just you know the way you'd spend your summer after high school and all that. All right, well, uh, All right. Dan, this has been great. Um, thanks so much. Hopefully yeah, yeah. I'll see you again on stage in, in like three, three years. more years. Yeah. yeah, thanks so much. Thanks, thanks Mark. Everybody. <laughs>